Charles, sir. Yes, ma'am. Sir, uh, am I audible and clear, sir? Uh, there is some uh, disturbance in the back end. Just look into that, ma'am. Sure, sir. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Sir, uh, am I audible and clear, sir? Uh, there is some uh, disturbance in the back end. Just look into that, ma'am. Sure, sir. Hello. Hello. Hmm. Hmm. Charles, sir, am I audible and clear now? Ma'am, you are. Thank you, sir.
Salsar, am I audible and clear? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I, Ms. Dorothy Deepa, Faculty, Department of Commerce, on behalf of St. Joseph's Evening College Autonomous, Bangalore, take this opportunity to welcome you all to the first day of the IQAC initiated three days national level virtual faculty enrichment program on the theme quality imperatives driving higher education outcomes. Prayer does not fit us for the greater work. Prayer is the greater work as a customary of a college backed by the Jesuit motto, ad majorum die glorium, meaning for the greater glory of God. Let us begin today's program by giving glory to God and to seek his blessings on each one of us present here. May I now request Mr. Jeffin Lejo, Faculty Department of English, to get us connected with God. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Ms. Dorothy. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Very good, very good morning, dear friends. A warm welcome to this virtual faculty enrichment program. As we begin this program, let's seek the blessings of the divine. So I now request you all to close your eyes and spend some few min minutes in silence. Let's prepare ourselves and feel the divine amidst us as we listen to this hymn. I request Amil Roy. so weary when troubles come and my heart burden me then I am still and made your in silence until you come and sit a while with me you raise me so I can stand on mountains. You raise me up to walk on stormy seas. And I am strong when I am on your shoulders. You raise me up to more than I can be. <coughs> You raise me up so I can 
Sir? Dorothy, please carry on. Hello, can you all hear me? Yes, sir. Go ahead, sir. Let's close our eyes. O oh, Divine, we thank you for this gift of life. As we come together as one family, shower your blessings upon all the stakeholders especially the resource persons, shower your blessings on them so that they may share the most of their knowledge on their topics. Bless the participants so that they may be enriched and gather vital information from this enrichment program. We also pray for all the committees, the organizers in charge, that they may be able to fulfill their tasks and the objectives they have set may all be achieved. We seek your guidance so that this program will be a grand success. Help us to be rooted in margins and work for the greater cause, greater learning. Amen. Over to you, Ms. Dorothy. Thank you, Mr. Jeffin and Mr. Amel Roy for bringing in the divine presence amidst us. St. Joseph's Evening College, the only NAC accredited UGC recognized autonomous evening college in India, managed by the world renowned Jesuit fathers who are pioneers in offering affordable quality education. Perhaps the best known education across the world is imparted by Jesuits. SJEC is considered a cerebral destination for students who take up various professional courses and who are placed in various organizations at different capacities during the day. And it is known for its illustrious history in developing men and women for the service of others. What makes SJEC different is its outlook towards life values and belief systems banked upon 
the Jesuit principle, cura personalis, which means care for the whole person, which is the hallmark of Jesuit education. SJEC offers a conducive environment for learning, be it academics or extracurricular activities known for its emphasis on academic excellence, character formation and social concern. And it is the ultimate destination for students to find new routes to fulfill their dreams with the concept of earn, pursue and learn. It is the only autonomous evening college in India providing all essential facilities to students to achieve the academic goals and transforming them into socially responsible citizens. With that quick overview about our college with immense honor and pleasure, may I now request our principal, Dr. Paul Newman to deliver the welcome address. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Ms. Dorothy. Hope I'm audible. Yes, sir. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. This is a very, very famous quote by the celebrated historian Will Durant. And we have been engaging our faculty into these kind of ventures where one's knowledge is enhanced. Honorable Chief Guest, Professor Lingraj Gandhi, Vice Chancellor, Bengaluru City University, respected Father Brian Pereira SJ, Rector and Director, St. Joseph Stevening College, my dear teachers participating in the conference, and all my dear friends and colleagues. A very good morning to one and all present here on the virtual platform. I thank you all for joining us today on the National Webinar 2021, the theme Quality Imperatives driving higher education outcomes. This is the first national conference in the history of our college, which is completely conducted on a digital platform due to the COVID-19 pandemic. At the same time, it is a pleasure to introduce you to the esteemed guests in this three days conference who have come from various walks of life. In this webinar, we have resource persons from the United States of America, from Malaysia, as well as Germany. We have left no stone unturned to make this conference a quality initiative, keeping with the motto of our institution. This conference has a unique theme, which is relevant to what is happening in the field of higher education in the contemporary world of 2021. On behalf of the management of St. Joseph's Evening College, the students, the staff, it is my pleasure to extend a very, very warm welcome to the Honorable Chief Guest, Professor Lingaraj Gandhi, the Vice Chancellor of Bangalore City University. To go on record, I presume this is the first conference which the Honorable Vice Chancellor would be addressing after taking over as the VC of our university a couple of months ago. Thank you, sir, for consenting to be with us. Thank, thank you so little. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much for your for consenting to be with us. For the Despite your very busy schedule, I welcome respected Father Brian Pereira SJ, Rector and Director, St. Joseph's Evening College, who again has taken his time out from his busy COVID-related responsibilities. A warm welcome, Father. I also extend a very, very warm welcome to all the eminent speakers and guests from all over the country and abroad from different walks of life. You have come here to share your knowledge and vast experience, as well as learn new updates to enhance our knowledge, which would be beneficial to the student community at large. The speakers in the program are uniquely placed to debate these and highlight the key themes, trends, and current practices for the audience. Once again, I welcome each and every one of you present here and wish all of us a successful and fruitful conference. Thank you and welcome once again. Over to Ms. Dorothy. Thank you, sir, for that warm welcome. I now request Professor Ravi Richard, NAC convener, to present the FEP overview. Over to you, sir.
Good morning. Hope I'm audible. Yes, sir. You're audible, sir. <clears throat> Respected dignitaries and uh, participants, I feel glad to share an overview about the faculty enrichment program on the theme, quality imperatives driving higher education outcomes. We are all aware that quality higher education is a key driver that determines change and progress among the learners, facilitators, and global community at large. Policymakers and stakeholders of higher educational institutions have been constantly emphasizing the need for enhancing innovation and quality initiatives and in HEIs to accelerate economic development, social inclusiveness, and nation building. In this context, the National Education Policy 2020 and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals have articulated various drivers of quality and innovation. And the same is in the process of implementation to benefit stakeholders in higher educational institutions. In light of this background, the internal quality assurance cell of St. Joseph's Evening College has conceptualized this three days virtual faculty level enrichment program on the theme, quality imperatives driving higher education outcomes. Renowned resource persons from India and abroad have been invited to present their perspectives related to the theme on the FEP on the following topics. Relevance of multidisciplinary approach in teaching learning process. Impact of outcome-based education on stakeholders. Scope, need and relevance of intellectual property rights for higher education. 21st century learning methodology. NAC new method of assessment and accreditation. Need for student-centric quality digital infrastructure in higher education benchmarking research practices in higher education. Besides the perspectives shared by individual resource persons on these six different dimensions related to the theme, there would also be a panel discussion. The topic for the panel discussion is good governance, best practices, and strategies for higher educational institutions. Five eminent educationists from India and abroad would be participating in the panel discussion. We look forward from these three days faculty enrichment program, impactful learning experiences, would, which would facilitate greater clarity and insights about quality imperatives driving higher education outcomes. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for that brief encapsulation. We are privileged to have with us Professor Lingaraja Gandhi, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Bengaluru City University, as our chief guest for the day. Professor Lingaraja Gandhi was awarded PhD from the University of Mysore and has a rich teaching experience of over 38 years. His areas of specialization are higher education, Commonwealth literature, post-colonial theory, African fiction, and Indian writing in English. Sir has conducted over 100 refresher courses, orientation programs, and short-term courses as director of UGC, Academic Staff College, University of Mysore, and has served in various capacities at University of Mysore, to mention a few, Nodal Officer for University Review Commission and RUSA, Director, College Development Council, UGC, Human Resource Development Center, Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation Board. Professor has held the Office of Registrar at Mysore University, Karnataka State Open University, and he was the first Registrar of Bengaluru Central University. Adding to his profile, Sir has served as member of Board of Appointments, Selection Committees, Academic Administration, 
and audit committees, UGC and state government, and has also served as Dean Faculty of Arts, Bengaluru City University. Sir has presented papers in more than 50 national and international conferences and has also been resource person in more than 200 programs organized by various universities and UGC academic staff college across the country. Sir has to his credit about 75 articles and interviews in reputed national and international journals and periodicals. He has co-authored a good number of books and has also published a book named Connecting the Post-Colonial. Moving further, Sir has also served as Professor of English at the University of Ape, Republic of Amen. Without further ado, with immense respect and gratitude, I welcome our Honorable Vice-Chancellor, Professor Lingaraja Gandhi to deliver the keynote address. Over to you, Sir. Thank you so much for your very generous introduction. Uh, well, good morning to one and all. Uh, respected president of this inaugural session, uh, Reverend Father Brian Pereira, the principal of St. Joseph's Evening College, Dr. Paul Newman, and all the distinguished resource persons from India and abroad, students, teachers, and all the members of the higher education community. Let me at the very outset congratulate a distinguished distinct higher education institution of the country, St. Joseph's Evening College, which has the rare distinction of being the sole autonomous evening college. And indeed, I'm happy as a vice chancellor of Bengaluru Central University, this unique institution comes under the jurisdiction of Bengaluru City University. And this three-day discourse on a highly relevant topic, quality imperatives driving higher education outcomes with such distinguished panelists and resource persons. They say it is a national level conference, but it has international global relevance and with international resource persons. Well, and this program is meant for the enrichment of the faculty. And the enrichment is a very meaningful expression. It is not mere improvement, faculty improvement. It is not even development. It is an enrichment. To enrich ourselves as and members of the teaching community, what it means, and what it means to be a teacher in the first case, in this global context. Every teacher today is a global teacher and is addressing the global audience. So therefore, the responsibilities of teachers has grown substantially. And this enrichment is a constant process. 
and teaching learning go hand in hand the moment one becomes a teacher that very moment he or she becomes a serious learner the real learning serious learning begins from that point really and the topics sub topics of today's conference are very well conceived and the central concern of all the topics is quality quality in teaching learning research and institutional governance and therefore quality is one thing which needs to be constantly acquired and what's a quality when quality has become a suspect when quality has become a victim and there are a skeptical views about the quality of education that's being imparted the quality of learning that is being taken the quality of teaching quality of research quality of publication there is a question mark in this context what is a quality does it mean the publication does it mean the conceptual theoretical understanding uh does it mean having more patents whether it is a teacher quality student quality or administrative quality so to to my mind there are of course there are many parameters to assess quality but quality in real sense a true sense is something that we need to discover quality and relevance to my mind go together what becomes relevant relevant to one self relevant to society relevant to economy relevant to culture relevant to the values or relevant to the market this is something that we need to discover constantly and is it the quality which really matters only at the end of the day only the quality survives nothing else so therefore does quality mean employability does quality mean imparting skills does quality mean values does quality mean character and as a synoptic note of the conference in the concept in the context of sustainable development goals of united nations and the nep 2020 so therefore in this context the global national context we all the stakeholders of the higher education community education management administration teachers students researchers we need to engage with the quality aspect and this is something that nep 2020 a holistic education policy which has aspirations to break all boundaries between disciplines across disciplines which emphasizes multidisciplinary approach 
because no discipline is an island by itself. Every discipline is so very well connected with the other discipline. So in this context, amidst the, inf amidst the growing knowledge, the exponential growth of information in the information revolution age. How do we, how do we address the issue of quality? Information is not knowledge. Knowledge is not wisdom. And wisdom should ultimately lead to the welfare, the well-being of the society, of the ma mankind. And this is the perspective. Therefore, in the draft uh, NAP 2020, uh, the learning objectives, the, the educational objectives uh, have been clearly defined. Learning to know, learning how to learn, learn how to learn, learning to do the application of the knowledge. You learning to do, learning to live together, coexistence, harmony, team building in. and ultimately learning education should liberate you, make you independent, not dependent. That is learning to be what we are, what we become. And th this in extension, what society we have, what country we have, how this country, how this society has to transform. And this is defined in the educational institutions. Education and development are so intertwined. Without the development in education, there cannot be any other development. And perhaps we are late in realizing this as a country. Our gross enrollment ratio 10 years ago, it was only about 11, 12. They are about 28 now. Look at the average GR of the every developed country, 58 and above percent. We are late. So therefore, the time has come for us as individuals, as community, as society, and as nation to rediscover education and NEP is to my mind the, the, the most important step in Indianizing higher education, Indianizing Indian higher education system, focusing on languages, our traditions, our culture, and to be connected to the society, critical thinking, moral development, and the multidisciplinary approach, liberal approach to the education. And therefore, in this context, St. Joseph's Evening College, has organized this conference for teachers, for the faculty, members of the faculty. And it is indeed a global conference with a global vision because we're all connected. And see the role of ICT today, 
how the education has been transformed with the technology. We are sharing knowledge, sitting wherever we are, anytime, anywhere learning. And the world has really become local, global, it's become a globalized village through this technology and thanks to technology. And this is one of the aspirations of NEP 2020. Education should be technology driven. And we have taken the lead. So with these words, uh, before I conclude, uh, let me recall one of the meaningful statements to my mind by his Holiness Dalai Lama, the winner of a Nobel Peace Prize, who says, we have more knowledge, but less sense. Sorry, we have more degrees. We have more degrees, but less sense. We have more knowledge, but less wisdom. We have more medicines, but less wellness. We have more experts, but we have more problems. We have multiplied our possessions, but have reduced our values. How education can set right this wrong. This is the challenge before us as a community. And at the end of the day, all our efforts, be it education, be it polity, culture, whatever, all our efforts should lead to betterment of life and the society. To conclude, let me recall Matthew Arnold's famous line, we have to leave the world better and happier than we first found it. This should be the goal of each one of us. This should be the goal of education as well. I express my deep sense of gratitude to St. Joseph's Union College for giving me an opportunity to share my views in this inaugural address on the three-day conference on the theme quality imperatives driving higher education outcomes. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir, for that knowledge-packed address, awakening our thoughtfulness and our urge towards the education and for taking out time from your busy schedule to be a part of this inaugural session of the three days FEP. It was a matter of great privilege and honor to have you with us. Thank you. Permit me to leave. Yes, thank you. Thank you. At times, our own light goes out and is rekindled by a spark from another person. Each one of us has cause to think with deep gratitude of those who have lighted the flame within us, Albert Switzer. On that solidarity, I now request Ms. Vidya, Faculty, Department of Commerce, to deliver the vote of thanks. Over to you, Ms. Vidya. Thank you, ma'am. I hope I'm audible. Yes, ma'am. No one who achieves success does so without the help of others. The wise and confident acknowledge this help with gratitude. Alfred North Whitehead. I, on behalf of SJEC family, feel privileged 
to propose vote of thanks for the inaugural session of the three day faculty enrichment program. At the outset, I take this opportunity to thank our honorable chief guest, Professor Lingaraja Gandhi for gracing the inaugural <laughs> session <laughs> and <laughs> delivering the keynote address, emphasizing on quality and relevance of education. I express my gratitude to Mr. Ravi Richard, Professor, Department of Commerce, for setting the tone of the program by giving a brief overview of the faculty enrichment program. Let me express my gratitude to Reverend Father Brian Pereira, SJ, Director, SJEC, for his unstinted support and motivation. I offer my sincere thanks to our principal, Dr. Paul Newman, for spearheading the program, and Ms. Dorothy Deepa, Vice Principal, SJEC, for her constant support. Permit me to mention our deep sense of appreciation and thanks to Dr. Kanishka, IQAC coordinator, and the organizing team for conceptualizing this program that is apt and relevant in today's time and age. I thank all the faculty members and our participants for joining us for this inaugural session. Thank you. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Ms. Vidya for those words of gratitude. We have come to the end of the inaugural session. Moving forward, Ms. Vidya would take over for the technical session. Over to you, Ms. Vidya. Thank you, ma'am. On behalf of the organizing team, I welcome the participants to the first technical session of the FEP. Quick instructions before we begin. Uh, the participants are requested not to post messages on the group during the session. The floor for question and answer session will be open once the session is complete and participants can post the questions in the chat box and we will be taking the questions forward. The feedback link after each session will be posted that needs to be filled in by the participants. Thank you. The central task of education is to implant a will and facility for learning. It should produce not learned, but learning people. Eric Hoffer. Having said that, it is time I welcome and introduce our first speaker, Reverend Father Joseph Xavier SJ, Professor, Department of Social Work, Loyola Institute of Technology and Science, Tamil Nadu. Father has over four decades of rich teaching experience. During this tenure, he has served at various capacities such as vice principal, principal, and director in many prestigious institutions. To mention a few, Loyola College, Chennai, University of Madras, St. Xavier's College, and St. Joseph's College, Trichy. Father holds a doctoral degree from Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Bombay, and carries to his credit over 40 research papers and publications presented at various national conferences and seminars. To add to his credentials, Father has been a consultant at Plan International, New Delhi, Gandhi Peace Center, Hyderabad, Childline Foundation, Chennai, Every Child UK and has trained personnel on various topics such as conflict management, leadership, transactional analysis at different forums. Indian Council of Social Sciences Research awarded Sir Fellowship for his doctoral degree. Sir is a recipient of Reverend Father T.A. Mathaya's award for innovative college principals and teachers by All India Association for Christian Higher Education. With immense honor and respect, I welcome Reverend Father Joseph S.J. to address our participants on the topic, Emerging Paradigms in Teaching Learning Methodologies. Over to you, Father. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Reverend Father Brian Pereira, the Rector, Vice President of the St. Joseph's Evening College, Father Paul Newman, the principal of the college, Dr. 
Kanishka, the IAC coordinator, and the participants. I am happy to be here to present to you some ideas on teaching learning evaluation. In this quality imperative drive for higher education outcomes. Now, I would like to make a presentation and uh, I will be um, I will uh, share my screen. Okay, are you able to see my screen, please? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I suppose I am clear, uh, clear and audible. Yes, Father. The theme of my presentation is, is teaching, learning, evaluation in higher education institutions. The University Grants Commission in its document that was recently published on blended learning has suggested that higher education institutions should implement new mode of teaching, learning, and evaluation. I'm sure many of you have gone through this idea presentation. It says that the area of assessment and evaluation needs to be explored more and made meaningful. And he says, the document says, Summary evaluation alone is not enough. In higher education institutions, evaluation- Father, if I may interrupt. Uh, yes. I'm sorry, can you just click on slideshow, Father? Because uh, the presentation is not uh, visible. It's not there. Click, It's visible, but if you click on slideshow, it gives a better uh, view. Okay. Yeah, now is it's it better. Okay? Yes, yes, Father. Thank you, Father. Okay. Okay. Now, in higher education institutions, evaluation is divided into formative evaluation and summative evaluation. Now, formative evaluation is done throughout the semester, and we use different methods to assess the understanding of the learner. Summative evaluation is done at the end of the semester to assess the overall understanding of the subject that is taught to the students. We all know that evaluation is broad-based and that is the need of the hour. Evaluation should be considered, should consider the different aspects of learning that is important to the students in higher education. We know that today, most of the curriculum is modular and we need to assess at various intervals, especially during and after achieving the outcome of a specified module that is present to the students. Further, cognitive skills, today are very important, especially in terms of logical thinking, application of knowledge and skills, analysis, synthesis of concept, all these are important and that is to be taken up in the summative evaluations and not necessarily through pencil tests and paper. Innovative evaluation strategies are to be used by teachers and UGC says increased weightage should be given for formative evaluation. For all this, out of box thinking is very important, especially for formative evaluation. This presentation will focus on teaching, learning, evaluation, and evaluation will focus on outcome based education the expected outcome of a graduate as he leaves the institution, 
and how Bloom has seen the learning evaluation in terms of Bloom's taxonomy. At the end, I will also attempt to mention a few methods of evaluation on online and offline. These are only suggestions and the teachers are expected to innovate different methods depending upon the level of the students and the need of the hour. Apart from teaching and learning that takes place in an institution of higher learning, evaluation plays a major role in the learning process. Now I'm moving into evaluation. What is, I'm sorry, I'm moving into teaching. What is teaching? Teaching is when a person imparts information or skills to another, it is described as teaching. Importing may mean to share experiences or communicating information either through lectures or other, other methods. We feel teaching and learning, teaching is regarded as an art and a science. Art in the sense, it talks about the ability of the teacher so that the student has a worthwhile experience. Science, in the light of logical, mechanical, procedural steps followed in an effective teaching method. There are a number of definitions on teaching. I'm just going to take one. Teaching is a scientific process and its major components are content, communication, and feedback. All the three are important. The teaching strategy has a positive effect on student learning. So when a person imparts information or skills to another, it is common to describe the action as teaching. Importing may mean to share experiences or communicating information through lectures or other means. And teaching is regarded both as an art and science. According to Gage, teaching is a formation of interpersonal influence aimed at changing the behavior potential of another person. There are a number of steps for the process of teaching. The first thing is most important is planning. Planning the content, analyzing it, identifying and writing of objectives. This is something that is extremely important if the teaching has to be effective. The one who is the instructor should be able to be clear on what he wants to give to the student at the end of the day. The second one is organization of teaching. Organization of teaching means strategies. And at the same time, whether the teacher achieves the objectives of teaching. Thirdly, he needs to look at suitable teaching and learning strategies. And this is done through effective communication of the content, which is in step one. Lastly, the teacher should focus on assessment of learning objectives in terms of the performance of the student, and this forms a feedback to teacher and the student apart from to, from to the institution concerned. What are the characteristics of teaching? Now, we have formal teaching, informal teaching, conditioning, or indoctrination. Teaching is suggesting and not dictating. Good teaching is democratic. The teacher respects the students, he encourages them to ask questions, answer questions, and discuss things. This is something extremely important, especially in the process of teaching. 
So we will say teaching is a cooperative activity which involves teacher and the student. And there are different ways of the teacher involving the student. In this process, the teacher stimulates the student's power of thinking and they also move towards self-learning. Today, especially in online teaching, self-learning is something that is extremely important. So this gives you a rough idea about what is teaching, what is the role of a teacher, what is the role of a student, and how the teacher should be prepared at the beginning of his, he has to uh, identify the various ways by which he will teach. He must be clear about his methodology. He must be clear about his objective and also treat the students with respect. Coming to learning. Learning is a process. It is not an end. It leads to change in the student. The change is effected as a result of an experience. And this also helps to increase the potential for improved performance of the student and also future learning. This is what Ambrose says. Now, in the process of learning, there is a change in the level of knowledge, attitude, and behavior of the student. As a result, the learner comes to see concepts, ideas, and or the world differently. Now, deep and long lasting learning involves understanding, not memory. Relating ideas, this connection that is very, very important. Now, the student does not come to the classroom <clears throat> with like a tabla rasa. He comes with prior knowledge. And the teacher gives him or encourages him to enter into a world of new knowledge. He also helps him to have critical thinking the ability to transfer knowledge. This is something extremely important in the learning process. Not only critical thinking, but the student should be able to transfer knowledge in different contexts. And transfer knowledge, the learning does not make sense. Now, learning is something students themselves do. Learning is not on the part of the teacher. The teacher teaches, but the student learns. And learning takes place when the student interprets and responds to their experience based on what is taught to him. Students are given significant opportunities to develop and practice intellectual skills, thinking processes, problem solving, scientific inquiry, learn motor skills, attitudes, values. Now, these are very important for a student to learn. And he also learns to develop interpersonal and social skills. Apart from that, the student needs to learn teamwork, effective communication, conflict resolution, and also creative thinking. Now, teamwork is something very important because the student is going into a, a world where he has to work with other, others. Communication is important because unless he is able to ex express what he knows, all the learning has no effect. And when a student is going into a world, he has to face many conflicts and 
he is continuously asked to do creative thinking to bring in new methodologies and so on so learning should emphasize not only memorizing something that is taught in the class but it is he must have to think for himself he must be able to solve problems he should be develop an attitude and values and he also should be able to have an interpersonal development with others today in our universities we teach content and in the process the student develops intellectual skills he learns but there is need to develop attitudes and values that is why UGC has been talking about the need for human excellence. Human excellence is an important ingredient in the teaching process, and then interpersonal and professional skills. Now, interpersonal and professional skills comes through the methodology that is taught to the student, like group work, and then his ability to make presentations and so on. and apart from that he also develops psychomotor and physical skills now this is what learning is all about apart from this we also have the student having cognitive skills now cognitive factors influence learning from ranging from memorizing to information like understanding application analysis and evaluation you know cognitive factors are important especially in the process of learning because a student comes to an institution with a broad range of backgrounds educational experiences prior knowledge skills and learning is determined by what the learner already knows about the topic and related topics if the pre existing knowledge is correct and consistent with the new information in the effect on learning is positive this is important you know a student comes with a pre existing knowledge so the teacher should give him enough encouragement to express what he knows and his ability to connect with the new knowledge that is given so if the prior knowledge is not known to the teacher and if the student has misconceptions or conflicts with this information his learning is not going to be effective now there are knowledge has to be integrated there are many forms of teaching that do not help the student concept contextualize their knowledge integration means his previous knowledge which is taken into account along with the present knowledge and the present knowledge is seen in a particular context in which the student is we should understand that many of the graduate undergraduate students they report they are not able to absorb or process large quantities of new information and consequently they do not perform well as they hoped for there are three, two levels of learning one is the deep level of learning the other one is the surface level of learning one is a deep level of learning in, comes in when the student is interested in the subject secondly he is determined to succeed thirdly he is equipped with appropriate background knowledge before he comes into the institution having time to pursue interests due to good time management it's not only classroom but also he must have enough opportunities to be able to pursue his interests then positive prior learning experience leading to confidence in one's ability to learn and succeed coming to surface 
approach, which we see in many of our students, it is taking the course for qualification. Somebody says, I am going to do this course only for qualification. Or someone told me once, I asked him, why are you doing your PhD? He said, this is the only degree which I can put before my name. Here you have a person who is coming to your college only for qualification. Not being interested in the subject. He asked for a particular pay course. He was not given. His parents forced him to take this and he is not interested in the subject. Putting greater emphasis on other aspects of their life like sports, social and so on. Lacking background knowledge. It's very important. So before a student is admitted to the institution, the most important thing is to find out what is his background knowledge. He doesn't have enough time or too high workload. He also has a cynical view of education, the institution, and believing that factual recall is what is necessary. And consequently, the student goes for high anxiety level. Now, this is, so keeping this in mind, the teacher should know how the student will learn. The instructors think about their classroom primarily as an intellectual space where students acquire knowledge. But the teacher should know the student is a person with emotions. So students' emotions and motivations, which play an important role in the learning process, should be taken into account by the teacher concerned. So their motivations, attitudes, feelings, influence their learning experience. Maybe a teacher should ask these questions. What motivates the students which brings him to this course? Are they enthusiastic about learning? Are they feeling that they can do well in the course? This can happen only through a process of mentoring. And I'm not going into details on mentoring because my time is short. Another important thing to learn or understand for a teacher in the learning process is Learning is a social process. Learning takes place through interaction with the instructors and peers. Today, there are a lot of questions asked about online learning because a student misses out this, the social process that takes place, unless there are ways by which this pro social process can be ensured through online learning. The other one is the classroom climate. Is the classroom climate intellectual, social, emotional? How is the physical environment in which the learning takes place? All these influence learning. Now, there are a lot of things that determine the classroom climate. The first thing, which is very important, is the instructor-student interactions. So teaching is not just passing on information, but it's an interaction. Then, how does the student and student interact? So there should be enough processes for that. Course demographics. Further, the, there should be also a social content in the course, like ethical issues, politics. Further, the tone of the instructor, which is also equally important. Friendly, accepting, tolerating. These are all the tone of the instructor. Not all students will experience the climate in the same way. Now, I'm not going to give you details on it because with, based on my experience, I can tell you students who come, we all take it for granted 
that the students who come into our classroom are all having the same experience and they have experienced the same climate. Just to tell you, in a hostel, a student was given a room. When he went into the room for the first time, he saw the room, single room, with cot, chairs, table, and so on. He had never slept in a, in a cot all his life. He had never sat on a chair to do his work, and he never had a single room. The experience was so overwhelming, he just closed the door, ran home, till we looked for him, and he said, the whole climate of the institution is alien, and we had to take him several sessions of counseling to bring him back to the climate of learning. Some of them so feel that the climate is unwelcoming or sometimes hostile, sometimes exclusive. You know, exclusivity, all of us know, given the fact that we are all in a not a equal society. So there are groups of students who exclude themselves from others and others are included. So a teacher must be aware of this for the process of learning. Other things are social and emotional challenges that comes. Yet another thing is to realize that a student when he comes in, he comes in with as a transition from school and the school is not the same as higher education institution. So some students find it extremely hard to adjust to the college. Now, some of the students are to manage a new academic demand, which is extremely different. different. Earlier, they were coached, they were guided. Here, the professor comes gives him information and leaves, and they don't know what to do with it. They also must learn to live independently. Maybe he has changed over to a hostel, establish new friends, and he has to manage his own finances sometimes. It is important to remember that every student has a unique socio-cultural identity. And to do one's best, he needs support so that he will be able to achieve his fullest potential. To summarize learning, learn, uh, learning is a complex process. Learning takes place in a context and learning involves a series of things that influence him. So what we need to remember in the process of learning is New knowledge builds on existing knowledge. Students vary their approaches to learning. They are not uniformly learners. And the teaching approach and the learning environment is extremely important. And we need to understand students' perceptions are the values of what they are learning, important. And their beliefs about their ability to do well in the course. Do they really believe? Then learning environment and course climate. These are all important from the point of view of learning. I just want to finish learning with this quote. More than ever, we believe that learners are at the center of the teaching and learning process. As a teacher, we can filter, highlight, guide, give feedback and encourage but the biggest variable in what determines final performance is what the learner brings to the table. I repeat, the learning takes place based on what the learner brings to the table. The learner's prior knowledge and its structure, the learning strategies, goals, beliefs, self-efficiency, motivation, all these contribute to their learning. And this is what Dr. Mars Marilla Swinsky has said in his book, 
popular higher education book learning and motivation in the post ekna post ekka ekondary classroom okay now i am moving into evaluation evaluation is to know what the teacher learned what the teachers teaching learning process is effective so evaluation is not to give an exam it is to see whether the teaching learning has really taken place and it is effective now for this you need a effective evaluation system during the process of teaching learning and at the completion of the program or every subject that is being taught the student is evaluated so evaluation is not an end evaluation is seen as a process and also it's a product now there are two things i would like to emphasize at this point one is on outcome based education the other one is bloom's taxonomy what is outcome based education i am sure many of you are aware of the document that came from ugc on outcome based education and the importance of outcome based education what is outcome based education outcome based education is a student centered instruction model it's a student centered instruction model which the vice chancellor was talking about which focuses on measuring students performance through outcome so outcome based education looks at the performance of the student how he is and outcome based education includes three things one is knowledge skills and attitudes now it focuses on evaluation outcomes of the program by stating the knowledge skill and behavior as a graduate now it requires knowledge and skill it is not only the student is knowledge is tested his skill is also tested and as i said earlier when the teacher comes to the class ahead of it he has already seen what the outcome should be so outcome is predetermined and students are evaluated on all the required parameters during the course of the program now what are the methods of assessment the methods of assessment of student during the program is left for the institution to decide and also for the instructor concerned there are various assessment tools for measuring like course assignments project work lab and presentation now these are all based on the graduate attributes in other words when a student moves out of the institution what will be the outcome that he has learned of course this is very important from the point of view of the effectiveness of teaching learning process you know the ugc has given a number of graduate outcome as he leaves the institution one is disciplinary knowledge which is important second one is communication skills third one is critical thinking problem solving analytical reasoning research related skills cooperation team work scientific reasoning information digital literacy today which is important self directed learning today self directed learning has relevance multicultural competence you know today we are not in one particular culture we have different cultures like language religion locality and so on moral and ethical awareness reasoning leadership readiness and leadership qualities lifelong learning so learning doesn't end the moment he leaves the institution these are all to be evaluated so graduate attributes that the students to acquire leaves the institution as he leaves the institution are to be measured and the way you measure is called evaluation as the attributes are related to different aspects of knowledge skills and attitudes they are to be measured 
with a suitable area of measurement. Now I am I have given a lot of explanations of all this, whatever the whatever I explained. Now I am going to Bloom's taxonomy. Bloom's taxonomy provides an important framework to design curriculum, teaching methodologies, and to design appropriate examination questions. It attempts to divide learning into three types of domain, which is cognitive, affective, and behavioral. Now, we need to consciously make efforts to help the student to go beyond remembering and help on understanding, but also help him to acquire application, analysis, evaluation, and creation. So Bloom has six areas, remembering, understanding, applying, analysis, evaluation, and creation. Creating. All these are to be measured. Remembering is memory, understanding is explaining ideas and concepts, applying use of information to another familiar situation. Analysis is breaking information into parts to explore understanding and relationship. Evaluation is justifying a decision or course of action. Creating is generating new ideas. Now, according to the revised Bloom's taxonomy, that is all in a, a, a hierarchy. First, remembering, understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating, and creating. These are to be tested at various levels. So according to Bloom, knowledge is hierarchical. And a student should move to a higher level. And the tested should be from lower level to low, higher level. So uh, testing only the memory of the student is not really useful. So the, normally we test remembering, understanding, applying, and to some extent, analyzing. But what is most important is the analysis, evaluation, and creation through mini projects, internship experiences, and final year projects. So, Bloom gives you learning level and assessment through creating, evaluating, analyzing. That is the higher level, which has to be through project, mini project, minor project, capstone project, and so on. Remembering, understanding, applying, analyzing will be through exams, which is through continuous assessment or end semester exam. Now, having explained what is Bloom's methodology, I would like to explain assessment. What is assessment? Assigning of assessment questions with course learning outcome. So you need to have course learning outcome to be clear before assessment process starts. And all the learning outcomes are to be tested. Please remember, not enough to test only one area, every learning outcome. What is given there, the 13 steps I explained by UGC has to be tested. And that is what the real meaning of testing is. Assessment methods used to adequately assess the content and desired learning outcome is equally important. Now, outcome-based education, which is a performance-based approach, has emerged as a major reform model in the global education scenario. Please remember, this is one of the most important things that is happening in the world. So the absence of proper mapping between program outcome and assessment tools lead to inaccurate, unreliable measurement of attainments of outcome by the students. So this has to be remembered. You need to map what is the program outcome, and how this program outcome will be assessed. Now, in the present context, examination system, which is dominated by memorizing, is to be slowly reduced. Assessment process should look at high level skills as Bloom talks about. And we need to apply knowledge, solve complex problems, Synthesize, communicate, work in a team, lifelong learning. 
for the effectiveness of program, the achievement of uh, POS is crucial, which needs to be proven through accurate and reliable measurement. Now, what are the types of assessments that are available? There is something called pre-testing, formative assessment, and summative assessment. What is pre-testing? As a learner end and supporters of the institution for higher education for a particular course of study, the learner is tested to see how much the learner is fit for the course of study, as which has applied for. In a graded system of learning, the learner is fitted into a higher level of learning, medium level, and learning at an ordinary level. This grading helps to fit the expectation and capacity of the learner and the level of the expectation of the instructor as well. For example, in Loyola College, when a student enters into a undergraduate course, the first day he will be tested for his knowledge of English and he will be put into three streams. Today, we have testing done for, say, for example, somebody who comes to our PCOM, he can either go about PCOM honors, PCOM application, or pass course. Now, what is formative assessment? Some of the things that you need to remember. Assessment forms and tools must be related to the learning outcome, must align with the program outcome. Each topic module must have a tool for assessment. Progress to next level must be only after verifying the learning outcome of the previous level. And timely and actionable feedback is necessary. Now I am going to give you some examples of the continuous assessment. For example, ePortfolio. ePortfolio is a compilation which the student does throughout his learning of a particular course. And not only he brings in whatever he has learned, but also his reflections, his experiences, the challenges that he faced, his attitude, what are the changes that had taken place? What are the philosophy towards life as a learner? And also his academic resume. It is called e-portfolio and it is a comprehensive tool. And it becomes the mirror of the learner for the world. So when a student comes to you and says, what has he learned? E-portfolio is something that is important. The other one is creative production. See, innovative packages use ICT, ICT tools and they have become creative products, either at the individual level or a group level. Now, this is a formative evaluation where the student prepares a creation, he makes a presentation, and then he gets a feedback from the professor concerned and his peers. Then he revises the concept and that will be assessed. This is called creative production. Now, the other one is classroom online assessment. This is, you know, we are not talking about paper pencil tests. We have been using, overusing paper pencil tests. Normally, continuous assessment means three tests, which is exactly the same as the summative assessment. It has to be changed. This, according to UGC, has to be discouraged as a formative assessment. What we need to do is to more use ICT tools for announced, unannounced quizzes, games, and many other forms of learning that takes place through continuous methods. Another one is the use of artificial intelligence. There you understand how much is the attention level of the student, the speed of learning, the level of learning, and so on. These are things that are very important. Now there I have given a number of examples of formative assessments, Lee project, reflective essays, learning logging, presentation, simulation, case, and so on and so forth. I'm very aware of my time. So I just go through this. The summative assessment. Summative evaluation is not an end semester exam as we understand. Summative assessment is using not merely paper and pencil. 
it is to encourage the student for cognitive skills logical thinking application of knowledge and skills analysis synthesis of concepts rules demand evaluation strategies and so on. so summative assessment should take into account all this there are a number of summative assessment methods yeah instructor created exams that is paper pencil paper then open book exam which i will explain standardized tests final projects final essays final presentation bio overche final reports and so on so summative assessment can have all these elements if you are really genuine about it then i'll explain what is open book exam because even two days ago in the hindu hindu there was an article on the importance of open book exam open book exam is like a written exam but the student it is designed in such a way that allows the student to refer to class notes textbooks other approved materials when he answers the question now the ans question should be such that he cannot directly copy it will test the skills of application analysis and evaluation this is what is known as the higher level of bloom's taxonomy actually uh, last year where i was in the business school we introduced this open book exam the reaction of the teachers were it is more difficult to give an open book exam than a written exam because in a open book exam the teacher should give him enough time plus his it should test his skills application it should analyze evaluate so every subject may not be amenable for open book exam but there are certain papers which can be done for open book exam like for example organizational behavior or something like that now in a open book exam set questions that require students to do things and the weightage is more for application of knowledge critical thinking use of resources for solving real complex problems so the question itself is complex and the you cannot finish your exam may say for example in 3 hours he may have to give him a whole day so that he can spend time question and so on and you need not assess every concept in a open book exam you may take two or three concepts and give him longer time for assessing now this is called the right approach to move away from the conventional approach to examination and also it frees the student from the fear of memorizing for the final exam another method is the group examination which can be done for projects laboratory assessment and so on and today group examinations are very much encouraged for the simple reason that a student has to enter into a world he has to perform his tasks in a group the last one is why you have che which it's considered to be old but for me it is something very important especially for communication the student is given a case he analyzes it and he presents it and he is able to defend what he has to say and he brings in solutions as well this is what the viva which does and that ends my 11 50 50 minutes that was given to me so i thank you very much for listening to me and if any of you have any questions you are most welcome to ask your questions thank you father for that meaningful session and taking us through the nuances of teaching learning and uh, evaluation now the floor is open for questions i request participants to post the questions in the chat box and we will be taking it forward
the questions can be posted in the chat box. We have a question, uh, Father, from uh, Himachal Pati, sir. Uh, he says, or he asks, what is meant by demography of a course? See, demography is a description. Now, demography of course, the teacher should be aware of the full extent of the course that he's teaching, not restrict himself only to the textbook that is given. That's the meaning of that. Any other questions from the participants? You can quickly post it in the chat box. Uh, okay. Father, there's a question from uh, Ms. Rekha. It says, how can we engage slow and advanced learners in the context of online learning? It's a little tricky question to answer. See, first of all, I was talking about pre-testing. So in the process of admission itself, there is a pre-testing to see the level of the learner. So According to the Vice Chancellor was talking about the national education policy, one of the things that he talks about, understanding the level of the learner. And the learner I can be a slow learner or a fast learner. Based on that, the curriculum, he can determine whether this can be done in Indian context today is a question. But ideally, it is a student who decides the speed of his learning. And the teacher understands that and he helps him. Now, in today's context, unfortunately, we all treat every student as equally gifted. So the same material is given to everybody. And that is one reason why our evaluation methods have been very, very ineffective. They are not giving them to test their ability to think for themselves. That is how I see it. There's a question from Marianne. Uh, how do we create inclusive learning climates again in the online context? Online, I'm the talk, sorry, I'm not able to explain that, how we can do an inclusive, but it is possible still through chat, uh, the, you know, we can divide them into groups, into classrooms, and then you can, uh, you, okay, you can have um, uh, meaningful interaction by them. What I meant by here, their inclusive learning is, you know, in our institutions, you can see those who are uh, coming from institutions which are better equipped and those students coming from lower institution, lower in the sense of municipal corporation schools and so on. And the very approach of the students is one of exclusion. They exclude themselves or the others exclude them. Now I have many experiences which I don't want to share at the moment, but you know, inclusive learning means it should take everybody in. Every person student in the class should be able to feel that he's part of it. Now this is important for a teacher. Exclusive learning is you take only a few people who are clever and you try to Concentrate on them while the rest are left behind. The consequence is that deep level learning doesn't take place. Okay. The other question is what are the values that can be imbibed in the minds of students in the present state of affairs? Um, in the present uh, state of affairs, how do you, how are the values that can be imbibed? If it is in the context of, you know, online, 
I have nothing to say. I am talking about a blended learning, where offline is there. As I told you, you know, interaction between the teacher and the student, interaction between the student and student, and interaction between the various levels of operation are very very important, and that can take place only in the offline learning. So in that sense, you will be able to give values to the student by the methodologies that we adopt. This is how I see it. The other one is: Can we do away with testing merely based on memory? No, memory can be used. I am not suggesting memory cannot be used. Memory is the last level of Bloom's taxonomy, as I gave you. Remembering, but then. memory alone cannot be a method of learning because learning means ability to integrate knowledge not reproduce knowledge so me memory does reproduction of knowledge well learning really in its real sense has to be involved in many other aspects problem solving create and so on so memory has a role but unfortunately today memory is the only way by which we are uh, testing students that's the only consideration i was talking about the other one is considering the imp implementation of uh, uh, the out outcome based education should the templates of marks cards be revised and also the criteria adopted for grading see the grading system has already undergone a lot of modifications after nac now outcome based education here only talks about what will be the student take with him as he completes the course now what is he expected to take communication he is expected to take problem solving he is expected to have certain values he is expected to work in a team so that is what we are talking about outcome based education it has nothing much to do with the templates of marks no a teacher can say in this particular test i am going to see whether he can connect various concepts yes that is possible now the next question is recently ugc has suggested 40% course to be taught online but is being opposed by teachers how would it affect students as well as teachers you see um, we had a real serious meeting about that I men uh, blended learning recently and uh, we were looking at this 40% is okay for an iam or iit but in a college which doesn't have the uh, kind of facilities that are required for online teaching and also the things that the student has like for example to my knowledge in our area about 50% students do not have laptops and they cannot have the class only with a mobile or many of them have just one mobile at home and so the students are to wait for one to complete so to suggest 40% at the moment is not a realistic one now what we suggest is that improve the for example internet connectivity let there be electricity throughout the day for the student and also help the student to acquire the means of learning like at laptop then introduce 40% certain places 40% might work in some place only 10% might work so in a blended learning we should take into account the institutional setting where it is located how the institution is have, have in terms of the required instrumentations and so on so that i i agree with the most of the things what the delhi teachers association has represented i i read through that and um, i feel that is very very important for all of us to look at
to what extent we can go for online learning today our in in our country online learning has not come of age unfortunately don't take examples like australia where only online is done yes there it is done because the students are the facility and the teacher has the capacity to reach out okay so let us look at our country in our context next question is values are meant in terms of human values what do the values that are lacking in the present generation of students you know this goes against uh, yeah, away from whatever i was teaching you know what i am talking about is in your course you must introduce values it is not only through one particular course you have values you need to have values in every course for example don't give a course uh, if you are a mathematical person mathematics when he is learning don't say a person is given so much and the interest rate is this and so on which means you are suggesting all this now values are important for today's development today we see students coming to class only to write an exam yesterday one of the professors was talking to me and saying that you are you know having classes hardly half the class attend on online but when you give a test all of them are present no that means the learning interest enthusiasm is not there they are coming there only for a degree so this is where we the whole context of teaching should change so that the process of learning itself gets modified and the method of evaluation also should be according to that this is how we see it father there's the last question uh, they're thanking you for the excellent session and the question is how can we effectively use ignatian pedagogical paradigm in our teaching learning evaluation process especially when we have classes with huge number of students okay you know ignatian pedagogical paradigm has three con three things knowing and then you experiencing and evaluating these are the three important things in ignatian pedagogical paradigm you caught me off off hand and i am just giving you what i learned long ago now experiential learning is something very important according to ignatius okay and then the student should have the ability to evaluate what he has learned are they meaningful are they purposeful and so this three angular circle is something very important as far as ignatian methodology is concerned and it is very much related to what i have been explaining today and i am sure you will agree with me thank you father for answering those questions patiently a small instruction for the uh, participants before we proceed i request all the participants to join uh, the zoom session with your names so that it becomes easy for us to uh, give away the certificates we have the uh, feedback form a link that, that is uh, posted you people can uh, fill the feedback form for the first session and i now invite ms marian to thank father and take us through the next session good afternoon everyone am i audible to you can you hear me yes ma'am okay so be on behalf of everyone gathered here i would like to thank father joseph xavier sj for enlightening us on the emerging paradigms in teaching learning methodologies and for answering our questions on how to improve the learning experience for our students thank you so much father i'm sure that the practical suggestions and the emphasis on integrating life skills including cognitive skills psychomotor skills etc us today uh before we move on i would just like to reiterate that the feedback form is available in the chat so please uh fill that in so that we can mark the attendance accordingly we'll now move on to the next speaker dr ts somashekar 
Dr. Somashekar has over 20 years of experience in teaching students of economics and law. He has been an Erasmus Mundus Fellow at the Institute of Law and Economics at the University of Hamburg, Germany in 2006, an advisor to the Ministry of Commerce and Industries, Government of Karnataka, to help formulate the industrial policy in 2008, a two-time United States International Visitors Leadership Program participant 2009-2010, a global visiting professor at the Deadman School of Law, Southern Methodist University, Dallas, for five years between 2011 and 2014. Uh, sorry about that. And an Indian Council for Cultural Relations Change professor at Sciences Po Paris in 2011. His publications and research reports are in the areas of competition law, particularly related to e-commerce, high technology sectors, and other areas of regulation. He is currently director of the Center for Competition and Regulation, an impaneled advisor to the Co Competition Commission of India, and a member of the advisory board for the European Doctorate in Law and Economics. On behalf of everyone, we welcome you, sir. Dr. T.S. Somashekar will talk to us today about the relevance of multidisciplinary approach in curriculum design. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Mariana, for those kind introductions. It's, it's my pleasure to be back at my alma mater. Uh, and it's also a pleasure to discuss this current topic. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, so I will begin by qualifying myself, saying that um, what I'm going to speak about is multidisciplinary approach in curriculum design and teaching. Um, and while I say this, uh, I say I clarify myself because most teachers uh, to different degrees uh, are already engaged in, the, in you know, some kind of multidisciplinary approaches in the curriculum design and teaching. So this you can treat this as an explorative approach towards understanding what you're doing and perhaps if we can go ahead in a better manner through developing a better framework. Uh, if there are any questions in between, please feel free to raise your hand and, and ask any question. Uh, so let me begin by, you know, just quickly, you know, first let's have a definition, uh, if any, of what we mean by multidisciplinary approach, right? So I've taken this definition of the UNESCO, uh, probably as standardized as we can get. All right, so what we mean by multidisciplinarity is an approach to curriculum integration, which focuses primarily on the different disciplines and the diverse perspectives that they bring to illustrate a topic, theme, or issue. A multidisciplinary curriculum is one in which the same topic is studied from the viewpoint of more than one discipline. All right, so it's there, you know, there are a couple of points that I've highlighted here. One, it says curriculum integration and studying a topic from more than one discipline. All right. So let's see how we take this ahead. But before that, let's see what is the immediate context with which perhaps we can speak of multidisciplinarity. All right. Now, I would say the immediate context is the national education policy of 2020. Now, what does this call for? The national education policy very clearly says we need to move towards a more holistic and multidisciplinary education all right and and it is laid out it is advisory in nature but gradually you could see more and more universities and higher education institutions moving towards this particular direction all right and so what is its target and what is it exactly expecting in this multidisciplinary education Here's what it says. It says we should pursue the knowledge of many arts. And when it, say, when it says arts, it means all the disciplines, including physical sciences and humanities. Right? Or we could, when, when we put together all of them into a pool, we call them as liberal arts. Right? So we say, uh, in, in this, what, what does the in NEP say? It says, well, STEM courses, science, technology, <clears throat> uh, these kind of courses, uh, should also offer humanities. And similarly, uh, courses which offer humanities should also offer um, 
optionals for students where they can also engage in certain types of research and studies in science. <clears throat> so what does this mean? It doesn't mean that students should lose their core competencies or the core skills that is set out to study in any one particular course, right? So rather what it means is you have your core courses and you have other skill sets which they acquire by the other optionals that they can choose, which can seek to develop their life skills, their understanding of the environment and such other subjects. All right? And all of these are to be done with credits being provided. Right? And what does it say in terms of a target? The NEP says by 2030, all higher education institutions should be multidisciplinary. And at least one such higher education institution should be in every district or close to a particular district. Now, this is the immediate context that we are speaking about. But if you go ahead further, there are other compulsive reasons as to why we really need to get into multidisciplinary teaching and curriculum design. So what does multidisciplinarity do for a student? Firstly, it provides a student a more holistic understanding of a subject. Now I'm going to run through these points and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to speak of certain examples to just highlight how each one of these points is actually practiced, is actually, you know, the outcome when multidisciplinary training takes place. So firstly, what do we do? We have a more holistic understanding of a subject. We don't look at a particular issue from uh, a single subject perspective, right? Uh, a more practical perspective when we get very theoretical or when it's a linear single subject approach towards a particular subject, a particular issue. It may not really be practical in reality. Uh, it provides for fresh perspectives. You approach a problem from, a, 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 you can say, an out-of-the-box perspective, and therefore uh, better solutions to pro real-life problems. It enables better collaborative work. All right? So you can work in teams with different skill sets if you have some basic understanding as to what those other skills mean. Overall, what it does is that it promotes critical and innovative thinking, which is very, very crucial in the present day life. Okay. Now, um, what exactly is multidisciplinary approach? Is this some new alien concept that we're bringing about now? Actually, in reality, multidisciplinary approach is all around us. We see it in our everyday life. Now, let's take a more drastic example of the current situation, all right? The current pandemic that we're all facing and forcing ourselves to be locked in and address each other through the mode of this particular platform, right? So uh, what does the whole health organization have to say with respect to patient care? The WHO says we need a multidisciplinary approach to care for patients with COVID-19. So what does it say? What does this multidisciplinary approach mean? So when you step into a hospital, you can't say that this specific doctor is going to treat you with respect to COVID. And of course, this also applies for various other diseases or you know problems that people may face, which force them to go to a hospital. Now, they call it as a multi-systemic disease. You know, better understanding has led us to understand that there's a multi-systemic disease rather than a mere respiratory tract infection. So what does it require? It, it, it also involves gastrointestinal issues. It involves cardiac issues, neurological symptoms. And then further, very importantly, mental illness, all right? People could easily panic, they, they could give up. So even though physiologically everything is fine, the mental weakness that creeps in during this particular process can actually lead to a situation where one where that there are more fatalities. So this kind of a multidisciplinary approach when adopted is going to lead to a greater number of lives that can be saved. And also very importantly, when we talk about the field of medicine, another very crucial aspect that is required is the role of ethics, all right? So when you speak of ethics, um, you know, 
we we you know we recall a recent event where this particular hospital in agra decided to cut off oxygen for 5 minutes to check and see apparently to check and see which patients would be least able to survive and then decide which patients should be removed from the hospital due to shortage of oxygen now when you lack an understanding of ethics and the other multidisciplinary approaches that are required for a person to run a hospital that includes the law and so on you're most likely to do such a such an act carry out such an act and of course it had drastic consequences with many people losing their lives so this is one example and what does this example speak of generally speaking this is about a, an area of physical sciences medical sciences where even in the area of medical sciences you cannot categorize them into different fields but you need to incorporate different fields within medical sciences and you also need to incorporate other areas that includes psychological aspects and also the role of ethics now i'll take another example and this example again all these are all applications of multidisciplinary approaches towards a study of a particular issue so this one is about crime investigation all right so let's say the legal rule is a defendant is entitled to use reasonable force to protect himself or herself or others for whom he or she is responsible and also for his or her property all right so let's say this is the legal rule now the problem is of course for an investigator or even for the courts to understand if this person used reasonable force and whether the context you know required the person to use this reasonable force all right or it could have simply been a case of you know someone just carrying it out for personal interest without any provocation all right so let's take this particular case so there's a 55 year old man who's killed in front of a neighbor's house and the body is lying there in a pool of blood on the sidewalk all right and uh, the neighbor's uh, house door is damaged and it's open and a window uh, is broken and also the neighbor's car's windscreen is also damaged all right so the neighbor admits and the neighbor says yes you know i was the one who killed this person and i killed him in self defense because this chap attacked me with a golf stick now the dead person's relatives however deny this they say no there was no provocation this you know he was just brutally murdered and so on and so forth and of course there is no golf stick over here now if you you do not if if there was a lack of multidisciplinary approach towards solving crimes it would be very difficult to solve these crimes all right so what what happens here let's see what are the various types of disciplines that are used over here in order to solve this particular crime firstly you have a canine team all right so a canine team you you get you get a couple of trained dogs which sniff this particular crime scene and based on this you know the, the canine team is probably probably you know made to sniff the person who attacked and then you know trace out if there was any such weapon that was used against him you know admittedly over here the golf stick so the canine team discovers that the golf stick is actually buried um behind the relative's house so the golf stick is recovered now after the golf stick is recovered uh, the next thing that they need to undertake is they see you know uh, shells you know gun uh you know shells you know lying near the body so they pick up those gun shells and you know then they test uh for gunpowder on the person's hand the the person who's murdered this chap they test for gunpowder traces on his body using particular scientific processes over there then an autopsy is done on the body to understand if the person was only shot and if if the if the uh, man who claimed that he had killed him in defense is in defense if whether his story is true all right and then you have dna tests and how are these dna tests done they take the golf stick and through what they call is a new technique a dna touch dna technique they extract a uh, dna from this particular golf stick and then finally they undertake a toxicology analysis to see if the person who killed this neighbor is actually free of any substances all right now on the basis of all of this they're able to establish yes there are traces of dna on the golf stick which means 
this person was actually attacked by the neighbor. All right, so that story is true. And, and then when they check for toxicology analysis, they find out, okay, the person was not under the influence of any substances. All right. And then finally, they're able to establish, okay, it was bullets which came from this chap's gun who killed him. And finally, they're able to establish, yes, there was motive. And this was done on the basis, uh, you know, purely for self-defense. Now, if you look at the number of different, you know, disciplines that are involved here in this analysis, uh, you will immediately understand the relevance as well as how important it is to solve this particular crime. Okay. Now, so what I'm trying to say is, is this multidisciplinarity approach is very important, not only for simple enforcement of law, but also for the formulation of policies. All right. Let's see, as we go on, we'll also have a look at policies and regulations and see how multidisciplinary approaches are very important for these as well. All right. Now, I will take this example of enforcement of regulations over here. Now, what regulations am I speaking of? Now, of course, we all know Google. We use the Google Chrome and we use the Google search engine for our internet searches. All right. Now, however, Google has come under intense scrutiny across the globe for certain anti-competitive practices. Now, what are these anti-competitive practices? Basically, it means that Google is using its huge size. You know, it has enormous economic power and it is also the largest uh, provider for web searches. You know, so in India, it's approximately about 95 percent of all the searches are done using Google, right? Now, the point is whether, you, know, you see, when we search for something on the web page, there are two different types of searches. Uh, firstly, there are the generic searches, okay? So we just generally search for something. And then there are what you call as vertical searches. Now, what are vertical searches? Vertical searches are where you're, let's say you're looking to buy a flight ticket, all right? Or you're looking to book yourself a hotel room. So these, when you, when you do this, then you get sites which allow you to look for hotels within them and choose uh, whichever is the one you really like. Okay, and of course you make your choice on the basis of price, on the basis of ratings uh, and its location and so on and so forth. Now, when you search for this, obviously what you would like to do is you, you would like to get the best possible outcome, right? Now, the point that is, you know, the, the, the issue with Google's searches was whether Google was actually manipulating searches in order to throw up its own verticals, all right? And whether on this basis, Google was actually excluding competitors, forcing competitors out of the market. Now, that would be called anti-competitive. Now, the legal process that would be involved in this and also in this process, the use of economics, so multidisciplinary uh, disciplinary approach coming in here is firstly, uh, from a legal perspective, they'll understand, okay, what are the relevant legal provisions that would come into picture over here? Then does it satisfy these legal provisions? Then the next one is, okay, what are the processes laid out by the law? And does Google satisfy those processes so it says abuse of dominance. So what they will actually look at in this particular context is to see whether Google is dominant. So in establishing dominance, they will use principles of economics, economic methodologies and you know uh, data methodologies. All of these are used in order to establish if Google is dominant, right? Now, after all of this, now I'm gonna stop sharing this and I'm gonna just show you something live. I'm gonna do something online and I'm going to uh, show you some interesting application of how you can take this, right? Right, let me share my screen while I do this simultaneously. Okay, so I'm going to type in here, I'm on a Google page, and I just want to type in over here, um, Bangalore, to Delhi, okay? And I, I want a flight, Bangalore to Delhi flight, okay? Now here you are. Now look at what I get on my search page. So I'm looking, basically these are verticals, okay? So once I enter this, I get different sites over here, 
all of these are sites within which I can I can get into these and then I can search for flights. Okay. So here I have I have one site called Travel Luke, and then I will make my trip. I have used my trip, and then I have Air Vistara, which is a specific uh, service provider, right? Now, but look at the top four search results. Okay, the top four search results are all ads. You look at that over here. These are all ads. Okay, which means that if I click on this, then Google gets paid for it. All right, so it's it's on a click basis. Uh, it has certain parameters on the basis of which it gets paid. So Google gets paid for it. So the top four search results are all advertisements. And then you come down and you see the first, you know, search portal that you get, which is non-ad, all right? And that is this one actually over here, where it, it shows that it shows the dates and you can, you can in here give you a return date and then you can search. Now this one is a Google vertical. Okay, so this Google vertical will take you to other sites where you can purchase your ticket and so on and so forth. And then below that, if I scroll, then I'll get again, make my trip, which is non ad based, and I can get go e by go, and then I can get Yatra, or let ease my trip, clear trip, and sky scanner, and, and you know, so on and so forth. Right? Now, the point is over here, why is Google search coming right up here? Now, here's how we will use multidisciplinary approach towards analyzing this. Now, you will say, look, um, that there, there really should be no problem because you know what? Uh, once people come here, you know, they, it's not necessary that they're going to stop here and they're going to search over here and therefore resulting in Google capturing the entire market for people who are looking for buying tickets. They can easily scroll down, is the argument that we can. So we can scroll on and we can come to these pages or we can even go to alternate pages why go to the first page we can go to the second page however here's here's what the role psychology does all right so i just stop sharing so so we, we have had the use of law we've had the use of economics now we come to the role of psychology now what is what is the role of psychology this particular we need Really, what happens to us is generally, you know, for all people, is that we are habitual animals, right? And by saying we're habitual animals, the and in, and in psychology, in behavioral psychology. Okay, it says my voice is breaking, so I'm just going to turn off my video for some time. All right, so in behavioral psychology, this uh, people generally have this tendency which is called as status quo bias. All right, they continue to do the same thing over and over again, they don't want to change. All right, now if we if I were to ask you all a question, you know, maybe let's say this is going to be uh, let's let's call this as um. Uh, a poll. All right. So I'm just going to put up the uh, participants over here and I'll ask a question. Now, how many people have used search engines um, other than Google search engines? You, you can just, uh, you know, uh, say yes. Um, if, if you have, otherwise you can, you, you needn't say anything at all. You can just type it up in the chat and say, yes, you know, I've used an alternate search engine. Okay, so um, I have I have some chats coming up. Not much, okay, but but I have no confirmation. No one says yes. All right. Now the question is: Look, we have huge privacy issues. There's there's a hue and cry right now with certain apps being pulled up by the government with respect to privacy related issues. Facebook being pulled up. And of course, Google also being questioned for privacy related issues in the US and increasingly so even in India, right? Now, the question is, if we are all so sensitive about privacy, why don't we just change the search engine? Now, there are plenty of other search engines that are available, right? Now, now we could say there are two reasons for this. One is because we like Google, Google is good, right? 
and that obviously also explains uh, you know why we don't want to leave Google. Google is good, and part of the reason why Google is good is also because of what you call as network effects. All right. Now, when you get into network effects, we get into the IT related aspects. You know, so when we want to establish that Google is dominant and how it is dominant, we also get into IT related aspects, and we say, you know, Google is able to gather so much of data and is able to improve its product, and therefore, because it improves its product, people want to continue to be with Google. So that makes Google almost a single player. And therefore Google, by virtue of being a single player, can quite easily manipulate uh, aspects uh, of what it offers such that it continues to maximize its own revenue to the detriment of competitors. Possible, right? Now the question is, but hold on, uh, why don't people go to other, other search engines? Now, for instance, there's, there's a search engine called as DuckDuckGo. If you go to DuckDuckGo, it, it ensures all the privacy that you want. No one really knows, you know, what you're searching for, what you're reading, and what you're doing online. But we don't use it, right? Part of the reason is when you get into the psychology of consumers and, you know, generally people, is that we tend to have what you call as a status quo bias. We don't want to change. Now, the other part of this lazy bias of us is that studies have shown that people, when they search for something, they barely spend a fraction, you know, very few seconds before they choose what they want. All right. So within a, within a couple of, not even a couple of seconds, approximately about 1.6 seconds is what they take before they click on a search. And how many people actually go to the next page? So what we're trying to say is that they don't scroll down. People don't scroll down. They try to go within the first few searches. All right. Now, the next point that is being made is statistically what has been discovered is very, very few people actually even go to the next page. All right. So majority of the people, about 68 to 70 percent of the people prefer to just stick to the first page. Now, when you look at this part, this aspect of the psychology of users and the actual behavioral aspects, then you can clearly establish that, you know what, Google is clearly dominant. All right, and by engaging in this particular act, it could be actually abuse of dominance. It could be actually clearly excluding competitors by actually pushing up its own vertical up there. But then when we speak of, at the same time, I'm not saying that Google is being abusive of its dominance. I'm trying to say that what is happening is that we still need to understand the technical aspects behind Google's search engine, Google's vertical being placed right up there. So is it actually because Google's uh, vertical is so popular? What, what are the metrics which Google uses to place these uh, searches in this particular order? So these are all the various aspects, disciplines that we need to understand in order to analyze and enforce a particular policy. All right, I'm getting back to the slides now. Okay, now let's move on. So that was the third approach, third example. Now, the next point that I want to make is that when we speak of multidisciplinary approach, um, it's multidisciplinary approach is no longer what you call as a simple fad. You know, you know, we all we all speak of multidisciplinary approach in order to market different schools or different universities. No, multidisciplinary approach is now a compulsion. It is very essential for higher education institutions and for universities to adopt this for the simple purpose that if they want their students to be relevant in this competitive world, in this world, in this 21st century, in which we are witnessing the fourth industrial revolution, we don't have an option, right? In the current context, we notice that there's a high unemployment rate in India. And when you look at the breakup of this unemployment rate, you notice that the unemployment rate among graduates is higher than the other people. Now, why is this the case? One of the important reasons why this is the case is for the simple reason that our graduates are actually unemployable. The quality of education that they're getting is poor. Now, what has suddenly changed that the quality of the education is poor? You know, when you look at the 90s, they were all highly employable in, in the software industry and, in, and you know, the um, outsourcing industry, they were all very highly employable. What has changed suddenly? 
Now, the, the fourth industrial revolution has changed what it is looking for. It, it you know, it's it's making several jobs redundant. All right, so here's a here's just a quick study, uh, you know, a quick snapshot of McKinsey's study. So what is McKinsey's uh, study actually telling us? Uh, it's telling us that 50% of the current work activities are technically automatable by adapting currently demonstrated technologies. All right. So six of 10 current occupations have more than 30% of the activities that are technically automatable. Now that, that's a huge risk. How are we training our students for this not future, for the current situation? All right. And the next question that we ask ourselves is how are we training our students for the unexpected future that is that's going to come up? Things are changing so fast. So how are we adapting? How are we giving them skills that allows them to adapt to the changes that can take place? And when I say changes, unknown changes. All right. So here's the kind of jobs that are expected to be displaced. All right. And, you know, if, if in a very conservative manner, we are talking about a uh, workforce that would be displaced is about 10 million and uh, midpoint average about 400 million. And, you know, the fastest scenario is where 800 million jobs would be lost by 2030. Right now, that's a phenomenal aspect. Now, there is no point in us continuing to provide education in this particular manner if we cannot empower them to face this particular unknown scenario that is coming up all right so let's move ahead so how do we go about this uh, what particular skill sets how do we develop a curriculum in order to ensure that our students are ready for this particular fast developing world now here are certain critical areas that every curriculum should seek to provide and these and and this is not derived just generally but this is derived by a survey of firms that seek to employ. And what is it that they're looking for? So what are the critical areas that we want our students to be ready for? Now, firstly, they need to be aware of sustainable development, co development goals. All right. And within the sustainable development goals, we need to ensure that they are aware of things like gender equality. There are about 17 sustainable development goals. We need to ensure that they are aware of gender equality. All right. Every university um, must make sure that the students are aware of uh, sexual harassment codes, uh, what amounts to sexual harassment, and every university must have this particular process. Every higher education institution must have this process, which sets about to ensure that people feel safe and people must be aware, students must be aware of gender equality, climate action, reduce inequality, all right? no poverty, zero hunger. These are all the sustainable development goals, which our students, when they step out in this world, they must be aware of. They must aspire to achieve if we are to ensure that this planet is going to go about in a sustainable manner. Right? So these are the set, first set of skills that we need to provide them, understand. The next one is skills for the fourth industrial revolution. Now, what are these skills that we need to train them for? First is practical skills. Now, when you say practical skills, most often what we look at is students have a lot of certificates, but these certificates in themselves do not really show that they have practical skills. Can they actually uh, solve problems, right? Do they have demonstrated capability in the sense that have students actually, you know, for instance, if you talk about IT sector, have they, you know, for participated in say, uh, ethical hacking competitions or problem solving competitions uh, which are put up online and what have they demonstrated so this is similarly in in various other disciplines as well what demonstrated capability do they bring front passion for the subject now when you say passion the, these are people who don't just look upon it as a particular um, income earning job that they're looking for, but they're also looking upon it as a passion, something that they make it as a part of their life. And therefore, they're ready to constantly update and learn. Now, no firm is looking at someone who just wants to join for a small amount of period and then leave. They want to make sure that this person is looking to constantly improve upon because the environment out there is quite dynamic, is no longer constant. 
almost every month there's something new that is taking place. So they, are they willing to adapt, learn and keep themselves moving? And then of course, basic language skills, all right? And they must also be ready for the international environment. Okay, please excuse the spelling mistakes there. So when we say international environment, uh, in an increased, increasingly globalized world, you know, you've got to be prepared to deal with clients from different countries. You've got to be prepared to deal with people from different countries. So you need to have multicultural skills, which could include different languages. You need to be ready to for what you call as a diverse environment. <coughs> and then skills for the new century. Sometimes they could overlap, but they don't completely overlap. Now, there are two types of skills that we need to get our students. One is application skills, applied skills, and the second one is basic skills. So basic skills, we need to ensure that all our students, when you're talking of students from STEM, uh, we need to ensure that languages are good. Um, math, of course, uh, when you talk about, you know, humanities, we need to ensure that they have basic math skills, history, geography, humanities, economics, and civics. All of these are a part of the basic skills. We don't want people to be ignorant of the social construct in which they are presently placed in. All right. If you are ignorant of the social construct in which you're placed in, you will be seen as a person who is not capable of working in a team, not capable of working in a creative environment, in, in, a, in an environment which has a lot of diversity. All right. So what are the applied skills that we're looking for? Excellent communication skills, which means the English speaking skill, the English writing skills in this current environment, whether they like it or not, has to be good. We're looking at people willing to work and good to work in teamwork. They can work, can work in diverse, you know, social environments. They have good IT skills, ethics, strong ethical basis, leadership, creativity, creative thinking and innovation. Now, these are all the applied skills that are so crucial for this particular new century. All right. Now, of course, the question, when we have all of this, what we also need is a proper assessment structure. Now, all of these, you know, we may not be able to bring about each one of this, right? We need to have a process in which we provide students opportunities for all of this, right? Opportunities for teamwork, opportunities for leadership, opportunity for you know, uh, learning, you know, developing strong ethical basis, right? And then finally, we also need to have a framework for assessing students, all right? So we should be very clear in the upfront as to how students would be assessed. And, you know, this assessment should be constant with a constant feedback, allowing them to constantly assess themselves and as to where they're moving. So an assessment framework must also be developed by higher education institutions. So how do we go about this in a practical manner? You know, how do we incorporate multidisciplinarity in our teaching? One way of incorporating multidisciplinarity in our teaching is what you call as cooperative teaching. Now, for instance, someone teaching political science may call in a person from economics, or you know, they may call in, let's say, for instance, the issues about you know. Um, you know, are actually water machines being manipulated? What is a water result in this particular state? So, you know, they might just decide to call in someone from the IT industry to demonstrate uh, whether machines can actually be manipulated, or they might even actually um, call someone from the stream of sociology to, you know, present a cast a matrix of this particular state and to understand why voting patterns are actually fit in maybe or maybe not within a particular caste based outcome. So having this kind of a cooperative teaching enhances both our own knowledge as well as allows students to have different multidisciplinary perspectives towards understanding a particular problem, right? Um, then of course, we, and how do we, the other ways in which we can ensure that they learn this is to provide them assignments, small research essay assignments, which are multidisciplinary in terms of the study that they got to undertake. So it might involve small data analysis. It might involve analysis from different subject perspectives and also follow that up with presentations so that their speaking and presentation skills can improve. 
Now, in most cases, a student is very skilled, but unfortunately, because of their poor presentation, they're unable to actually make it through uh, when, when they want to, you know, actually appear for a job interview. Now, of course, all of this is not strictly about a job which students need to get, but it is also about developing students so that they become good citizens of a country. Now, the other thing that we can do is to provide them readings that require them to have a multidisciplinary approach in terms of analysis. So don't provide them readings which are purely disciplinary wise. Provide them readings which have, you know, multidisciplinary you know, analysis which are involved. And then most importantly, we need to have a flexible course structure. In higher education institutions, we can no longer go by the traditional course structures. You know, um, we, we define them as saying, okay, we have, this is our, you know, BA program, this is our LLB program, this is our BSc program, this, this is our BTEC program or MBBS program. No, the, increasingly what we need to do is we need to combine humanities with physical sciences and physical sciences with humanities in order to give them these kinds of skills that they need. And how do we do that? We provide them a flexible course structure. We say, okay, these are your core courses. So you need to choose these core courses. And besides that, you have these optional courses. All right. And the optional courses could be smaller in terms of the academic construct, in terms of the number of hours, in terms of the credits. And you provide them multiple choices. And you define them saying that you need to earn a minimum number of these many credits in these optional areas so as to fulfill this assessment mechanism. Now, the other important way is, is when we assess them is to not always adapt a mechanism of exams. Now, exams do not always succeed in everything. You know, the, the core exam system, uh, it really does not succeed. Uh, so we need to also have practical exercises probably incorporated within this, which can also be, which can make learning fun. And at the same time, ensure that we test them, not only for, you know, you know, one of the defects of the Indian education system has been pointed out several times is that it's more rote based, more memorizing based, right? So we need to get out of that. We need to ensure that there's more application oriented learning, which will also involve exercises which are practical in nature, right? And then of course, we need to engage them. We, we ourselves need to engage in multidisciplinary research. So when you say multidisciplinary research, let's say for instance, uh, an institution has a particular research project. Now in this research project, don't just stick to that particular department involving you know, getting into that research. Call people from different disciplines and see what perspectives they can bring to this particular research. When we do this, we're able to bring a fresh perspective. We're able to make this research that it more practical and also um, you know, better implementable in that sense, All right? So I'm gonna stop at this particular point and uh, take questions if there are any. Uh, the floor is open for questions. You all can post it in the chat and I'll ask it to, the, uh, to Dr. Somshekar. Uh, yes, sir. Can you give examples of high quality undergraduate and postgraduate programs in India, which have emphasized on the multidisciplinary approach in curriculum design, teaching, learning and evaluation process? Uh, that's from Mr. Ravi Richard. There are, I would say there are two. Uh, one is, of course, in, in uh, um, NLS ourselves, we are, we are trying to implement this multidisciplinary approach. And we are trying to develop a liberal arts approach ourselves. Uh, we incorporate students into our research work and we bring in faculty from different disciplines into our research. We allow students to intern in centers with this multidisciplinary approach where um, you know, they have to incorporate learnings from the field of technology, from the field of um, quantitative techniques, from the field of law, from the field of economics, and also from the field of psychology. So uh, these are all aspects that they need to bring in for purposes of the study. Another good example could probably be uh, Ashoka University. I'm not advertising for them, but uh, just saying so that Ashoka University also seems to have this flexible approach uh, towards students learning uh, liberal arts. So those, uh, those are two examples that I can provide immediately. 
Uh, this is from Dr. Rekha. How do you suggest we encourage family, uh, sorry, faculty members to start using a multidisciplinary approach in their teaching? You know, there, there is something called as the nudge theory. Okay. Um, the author of that got a Nobel Prize for that. Um, we need to understand behavioral psychology to try and develop policies to get faculty to develop multidisciplinary research. Probably one thing you can do is from an administrative perspective. It's a very good question. Stop putting people of the same discipline into a faculty room. You know, put faculty of different disciplines uh, close to each other. You know, put someone of economics next to a person from mathematics. Put someone from psychology next to a person from sociology, right? So when you do this, you know, the people whom we most often interact with are our neighbors. Now here, what you have is you have isolated blocks. You divide your faculty into a science block, into a humanities block, uh, and into these blocks. And, and they are in different groups themselves. Stop doing that as a beginning. Put them all together, mix them up, and, and let them interact with each other. And I tell you, uh, through simple conversations over a cup of tea, you'll find tremendous things taking place, right? And secondly, put faculty, make faculty to attend presentations of different disciplines, all right? So there, there's a research presentation, you know, ask people to go attend that, right? And just generally, even, even a flippant observation might just actually turn out to be something very relevant, right? So we need to mix people together. That's the first step. Then the second thing that we need to do is to try and encourage faculty to publish, right? So before we talk about publishing, we know that publications itself in India generally is very poor. So we need to first get the publications out, right? And how do we develop multidisciplinary uh, approaches towards research? Get people to work together from different disciplines to write papers together. Right. So that these are some practical steps which I can suggest. Thank you. So are there any other questions? Uh, one question that I had, sir, in the context of a flippant uh, observation is um, what I find is often in a multidisciplinary approach, there is some thread or for want of a better word, some synthesis between the disciplines that are a part of that approach. So I was wondering if that is something to consider when creating a multidisciplinary approach towards a particular challenge, or would that be an exclusionary way of thinking of something? Intrinsically, certain subjects you could say are close to each other, right? So you might say uh, physics and mathematics might go well together, right? But then we must, there's another question that is coming up. So I just pull in that question as well and I'll, and I'll answer this question. So we're talking about suggestions for a college to encourage entrepreneurship among students. Right? Now, as faculty members, people in the physical stream, in the physical science stream, uh, they are unaware of their intellectual property and the protection of the intellectual property. So all faculty in the physical stream should be given a course, a basic course on IP rights, right? What are the basic steps? You know, what, what, is, what is patentable? How can you patent it, right? And how can you market it? So when you have this knowledge, two things happen. Remember, human beings are driven by incentives. So when you know that your research is patentable and marketable and possibly fundable as well, when you take it to the market, you have an incentive to actually go about. So you have the knowledge, right? And you know that there's something that can be generated through that. And you move ahead in that particular direction. It encourages further research. So this is not a physical science. IP is about, a, it's, it's a law discipline, right? So similarly, while there are some if you want to develop entrepreneurs uh, among students and among faculty, first is to allow them to explore within the university in terms of basic knowledge, such as IP, and second, in terms of exercises. Now, for students to become entrepreneurs, for anyone to become entrepreneurs, the first and most important thing that the challenge that we got to surmount is the issue of risk, right? 
Now, obviously, uh, when students spend a lot of money on education, they want to get into a certain job so that they're able to recover any loans that they've possibly taken for the education. So it's quite practical on their part. We cannot expect everyone to become an entrepreneur. But one thing is clear. If our country has to develop in terms of productivity, has to develop in terms of innovation, we need more entrepreneurs. Now, if you look at it from a comparative perspective, we keep comparing ourselves with China. The only aspect in which probably we are a little ahead of China is in terms of the number of entrepreneurs we churn out. And Bangalore is a hot space for that, right? So if we need to churn out more entrepreneurs, we need to give them opportunities apart from the theoretical knowledge in terms of entrepreneurship courses. For instance, there is, uh, oh, I also in some ways double up as an advisor for startup ventures. And you know, different colleges also have what you call as e-cells, entrepreneurship cells. Now they, they become institutionalized. What we need in, in terms of e-cells is for students themselves to incubate e-cells, develop it themselves and run e-cells like a firm. So we told our students, you got to find your own funding. You got to find your own sustainable model of running an e-cell. So you get the practical experience of working as an entrepreneur. And then of course, you run them through the, you know, the usual competitions, invite venture capitalists, see if there's any new idea that has come up and the same run of the drill sort of stuff. The top five ideas that come out through a competition, including your own students, get to work with a team of entrepreneurs in developing their ideas. So that reduces their risk because they see that there is a certain amount of funding available and there is someone to handhold them and take them through the process until they actually hit the market. And then of course, if you can develop an incubation center, it would be great. Thank you, sir. Uh, there's one more question. Before that, I just want to remind everybody to fill in the feedback form. It's available in the chat. Um, Mr. Ravi Richard asks, what are the specific ideas and methods suggested by NEP 2020 to facilitate a multidisciplinary approach in education. One clear suggestion that the NEP has said is that students of science must take humanities courses and students of humanities must take optional courses in the area of science, cross -cut, cutting its scientific areas. All right, need not be core areas of science. You know, it's not like asking uh, someone to learn, uh, you know, heavy duty programming but uh, you know for a student of economics now you know a student of economics has to learn uh, you know big data analytics so they, they might have to learn python programming so if you are teaching a bsc course in economics or a course which is a, a, an honors course in economics the standard run of the mill statistics sciences are no longer uh, statistics courses are no longer going to help you need to shift them towards big data learning you need to get them to learn some programming techniques like Python, right? So therefore you need to, this is one important technique that is suggested by the NEP and we, we must try and move towards such kind of, you know, um, innovative combination of courses that students have to take. Thank you, sir. I think that concludes all the questions we have. I hope I'm audible. Yes, you're audible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I request Mr. Jeffin Lijo to uh, propose the vote of thanks for today. Thank you, Ms. Mary Ann. So on behalf of uh, uh, the management, uh, Principal Dr. Paul Newman and all the staff members, so I would like to take this opportunity to thank our resource person, the guest speaker for today, Dr. Zoom Shekhar. For taking your time and in spite of your busy schedule, you accepted our invitation. And thank you very much for sharing your valuable insight with us. Sir. And as you are rightly said, it's true that in the dawn of a new era of Indian education uh, with respect to the National Education Policy 2020, I'm sure that we are moving, there's a shift from the conventional way of teaching to more of a multidisciplinary approach. And uh, it's very clear that that's the road ahead of us. So your presentation was very impressive, 
very informative, very inspiring, very comprehensive. And especially I personally like the examples that you gave, the substantiate, that helped us to understand better. I'm very sure that we'll be able to contribute in, in the field of higher education uh, and we'll be contributing our best uh, for the students as well. And I'm reminded of a very famous quote by Tolstoy. He says, just as one candle lights another and can light thousands of other candles, one heart can illuminate another heart and can illuminate thousands of other heart. So one of the most important areas we can develop as professional is competence in accessing and sharing knowledge. So in that note, I'm very certain that the participants from different institutions uh, or part of this webinar, faculty enrichment program board, uh, would share the knowledge with their stakeholders. So thank you very much uh, for your active participation. And uh, uh, before we conclude, there are a few instructions. So there is a slight change in tomorrow's uh, schedule. Kindly note, the session begins at 9 a.m. tomorrow. And uh, guest speaker, Ms. Hema, would address on the international collaboration with IBAS Switzerland, followed by Mr. Dorai Swami, who would share his knowledge on international management and status. So kindly join us on time. Always feel free to contact the organizers for any queries or any clarifications. So thank you once again for your active participation. Thank you very much. Also, you just much. once, just you. once. And would also like to Dr. Paul. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Paul. Welcome, Paul. Delighted. 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 With your presence. Your presence. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye, Song. Take care. I would also just like to remind you all once again to fill in the feedback form before leaving, as that would help us uh, make note of who to give the certificate to. Uh, see you all tomorrow. Have a nice day.